disciple making movement approach and also have an approach where you have a legacy church or a traditional church. Can these two be combined effectively or is that problematic? So today I'm going to dive in on that question. I'm also going to spend some time talking about what do you do with groups that are not multiplying? How do you get them to multiply or how long do you continue to work with a group that just refuses to to multiply or to pass on or start their own group? So these are two questions I'm going to work on today. For those of you that are coming in um, on this call, I would love to greet you. Let me know where you're coming in from. And uh, yeah, I look forward to any questions you may have about how to make and multiply disciples. Go ahead and put those in the chat. My name is Cynthia Anderson. I am a disciple making movement trainer and coach or a disciple multiplication coach. And I've been involved in disciple making and church planning for more than 30 years, mostly in Asia, uh, though I'm actually born in Africa and grew up there and have experience globally. So I've been doing this for a while, making lots of mistakes, learning lots of lessons, and I don't have all the answers, but most likely I've faced whatever issue it is that you are facing, at least myself, or uh, through somebody that I've been training and coaching and worked with on that issue. So if you have a question, please do go ahead and ask that. Or if you have a comment at any time about what I'm sharing, I would love to hear your comments as well. I see we have Malapu. Where are you coming in from, brother? Are you from India or where are you joining from? Let me know. And Others, as you come on, please let me know where you're joining from today. All right, so I'm going to dive straight in to this question. Do hybrid approaches work? So this question came in from one of our trainees, and um, I thought that's a question that a lot of people have. Let me go ahead and spend a little time on that. So um, there's a, a great book written by a man named Roy Moran, who leads a disciple making movement organization called uh, New Generations, and he's based out of Kansas City. He wrote a book called Hybrid Church. And so um, definitely he dives into that issue much more than what I can do in a short Q&A like this. So I, I wanted to right up front recommend Roy's book on that. But I, I thought maybe we could talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages to trying to combine a legacy church with a DMM approach um, rather than starting something new that is more of a, a disciple making movement approach from the beginning. And I know that many of those who take our courses are already pastors, um, especially those of you in Africa. You already have a small congregation that you're trying to motivate to be disciple makers. So this is really an important question for us to talk about. Some of the um, advantages, let me talk about the advantages first off, is uh, we really do want to see everyone in the church shift from being a church member to understanding their calling as a royal priest of God, their calling to be someone who would multiply disciples. And to become activated, right? We don't want to have passive people who just come to church. They're not transformed. They don't become obedient disciples. And there are some things about the disciple making movement approach, the three thirds meeting, um, as we call it, where we look back, look up, look forward, having friendly accountability, which are really, really needed in the traditional church. And so, the advantage, I think, is you you do want to challenge and equip your church members, if you're a pastor, to be more active in disciple making. I was just doing uh, another presentation on the Finding the Hidden Harvesters event, and I shared a story about a brother named Kuram uh, from Pakistan. He's one of our trainees, and Kuram had said, I really had heard the Great Commission all my life, but I had no idea, no idea that we were actually supposed to do it. How many Christians are out there who have no idea that when Jesus gave that command, it was actually meant to be done by them, right? And so a really big advantage to a hybrid approach is is we mobilize a lot of people. And I believe every Christian does need to be mobilized and motivated and trained to become a disciple maker. So um, 
if you're a pastor and you have a congregation, I thoroughly encourage you, train your people. Shift from being just a preacher to becoming a trainer and an equipper of those who are in your congregation and motivating them and training them. They actually can make disciples. Why do many people not make disciples? Because they don't know how. They've never actually been trained. They've only been taught that they should, but they've never been shown how to actually do that in practical ways. And so I would say in a legacy church, in a traditional building church, as we might call it, um, yes, you want to train and equip every church member. And so the the advantage of a hybrid approach is it does um, have the potential to activate inactive church members and help them to become more of who God has called them to be. Um, Yeah, ultimately, you know, this decision about whether or not you're going to uh, go with a hybrid approach, keep your church building and, you know, continue with that, or whether you want to start something new um, and start launch a new effort in a new location or a new place or with new people um, is something that we really need to pray about and really seek the Lord's guidance on. And different people around the world have done this differently. Uh, there's lots of different expressions and iterations as the Holy Spirit works and and leads in this. Um, some of the challenges that you'll in, you'll encounter as you are working to uh, to implement a hybrid approach. One is getting people to understand what the church is, right? Because once you have that building, there's just this unconscious understanding that I find no matter how many times we tell people this is not the church, the building's not the church, the church is the people. Somehow by having that building, it it makes people think that that is what is real church, right? That these other things that we're doing, these small groups, that these are just, you know, fellowship groups, or these are just supplementary things, but real church happens in that building. So breaking down that mindset is, I think, more challenging when you have a hybrid approach and you're still gathering every Sunday morning in the building uh, with those people. Another challenge that I've seen is uh, it can be challenging to get the groups to multiply. And we're going to talk more about multiplication in a moment. But as long as people are still connecting primarily to a building church, um, often they will not really be able to give the time and they won't really understand. So we find that those groups are kind of like small groups or fellowship groups. And certainly you can use the three thirds meeting or the, um, you know, a discovery Bible study in those groups to good effect. But what I often find is when it comes to the sharing and starting new groups, um, that's where the breakdown happens Um, Not always, but I often have seen that as a challenge. Um, There is a church in Minnesota. I was recently talking with uh, a a man there who um, they have worked with a pastor who is really, really on board about disciple multiplication. And this is another key that I would just pass on to you is if the pastor is not really on board to wanting to shift his whole congregation over to disciple multiplication and multiplying groups of disciples that will extend beyond the building. Um, It's very difficult to do this uh, to, to any real effect. And I would then encourage you put your efforts outside and start something parallel, not in opposition or competition to the existing church, but parallel and, you know, start something new and especially focus on the lost. Don't focus on churched people who already attend churches, but focus on lost people. And then when they come to the Lord, start new groups among them and start something new so that you can birth something new through that first person of peace rather than bringing them into an existing congregation. Because once again, that mindset, oh, this is what real church is, whatever we're doing over here is supplementary, will somehow be present in their minds. Um, And, you know, maybe this is why in some ways DMMs often work really well in places where there's persecution and there is no ability to have big big public meetings and public churches. Um, But that's not to say that we can't start DMMs in places where that, you know, where there isn't as much persecution. 
Um, but certainly that mindset shift and challenge is, is very real. Um, but like I was saying, this church in Minnesota, the pastor was really on board. And um, because of that, he had his whole eldership and leadership team go through training and understand they started modeling it themselves, how to start disciple making groups at Multiply, how to reach out to lost people and bring them into these groups. And so from the top top leadership down, there is a strong buy-in and a strong level of understanding. Um, and then, you know, it started to be really fruitful and really successful. And these groups began to multiply and uh, they saw great success with a hybrid kind of approach. Um, people still coming to church on Sunday morning, but really learning how to be disciples who make disciples. So it can work. Um, but having your senior leaders really on board and not just giving um, sort of a head nod assent, like, of course, what pastor wouldn't say they want to see disciples make disciples, right? Everyone would. But actually buying in and understanding um, what it means to do that and the major shifts in thinking and major shifts in um, practice that would have to happen for that to be possible. So, um yeah, another uh, example of a movement that has been a hybrid approach that I know of is here in Thailand, where I live. There's a movement that has taken off and grown and um, really seeing good fruit, one of the first real movements happening in Thailand. But this movement has decided that when they have a certain number of house churches, that they then want to build a building where all those house churches can come together for celebration and, and can gather. Um, you know, I have some concerns about that, to be honest. I'm not sure what the long-term uh, implications of that will be on the movement and whether or not it will actually stall the movement or slow it down or whether it will be an accelerator. Um, but I think somehow with the prominence of the temples and wats here, they felt like having a gathering point where people can go and worship was important to them. Um, again, I, I'm a little concerned about it because, again, it's so easy in people's minds and that is what real church is. And whatever we're doing here is not the real church. And um, it sort of disempowers, you know, the lay person or the royal priesthood and it gives extra authority and power to those who stand up on that platform and who are the clergy, the professionals, and re-emphasizes that concept um, instead of emphasizing the priesthood of all believers. So uh, that's some of my comments on uh, whether or not hybrid approaches work. Um, again, I just want to say once, once more that it really is something to seek the Lord about and ask God's wisdom on, but certainly we want to empower every believer, everyone who goes to a church to become a disciple maker and to learn how to function as someone who makes and multiplies disciples and doesn't just invite them to the church building, but actually invests their life in discipling those people. And we want to really raise that um, idea and that paradigm that this is what the Bible teaches. This is what Jesus intended when he sent us out in the Great Commission, that every disciple would make disciples, would baptize them, would train them and teach them to obey Jesus' commands. And then those people that they had led to the Lord and discipled would begin to do the same in other areas and other places. So uh, you want to do that in every church, in every way you can. But I think the changes that are required for a legacy church to really honestly shift over to that are, are significant. And um, a lot of your people may not be ready or willing to take that kind of step. But if you find a few who are, and you can start something parallel to that and really invest in it, maybe in a new area and start of, instead of starting a new church plant, you start a new movement in a new area and the church really supports that and you release some people to go do that, I think that's more the kind of approach that I would say has a good chance of success. But um, that's not to say I couldn't be wrong on this. Um, again, grab Roy Moran's uh, book on hybrid church and experiment and see how the Lord leads you. And again, if it's not working, do something different, learn and grow. And I know that God is going to lead you guys in this. Um, okay, I want to... 
check check if there's any feedback on that, any follow up questions. I see some new people have joined. Hi, Brenda. Good to see you and Prasanna um, and Olusina. Jeffrey, good to have you here. You're so faithful in showing up at these. And um, yeah, if you have any follow up questions or comments about what I just shared, please go ahead and feel free to uh, to share those. All right, let me jump into this next question that uh, came up in a training I was doing in Nigeria. Some of you know I was just recently in Nigeria running on-site field training and follow-up coaching with some of our trainees there. And this question came up and I didn't have time to address it, so I promised the person who asked it I will talk about this on my next live Q&A. And that is, what do you do with groups that are not multiplying? So they had started a couple of different groups and uh, the groups were functioning fine, but there was there was no multiplication happening of the groups and it was a concern to them. Anyone here who has experienced that? Yeah, let me know, okay? But how do you get those groups to begin to multiply? Well, the first thing that I would say is you need to cast vision regularly. In the three-part meeting, the look back, look up, look forward, in the first section, the last thing that we always do in that section is to do vision casting. And what do I mean by vision casting? What I mean is you include some sort of little story, you highlight a scripture, you talk about the lost in your area, you do something every time you meet to to recognize and highlight the needs of lost people and our call and our challenge. And the reason why we're gathering here is because God has called us to reach these people and make disciples among them. And God has challenged and called each one of you. And one day you will be starting your own new groups. And I'm expecting that to happen really quickly. We're here to be trained so we can be sent out and we can also go and make disciples and start new groups. So you want to include that short, it doesn't have to be long, but just, you know, two or three minutes, five minutes in that first part of every meeting where you're casting vision for the lost. Maybe you're sharing a story about um, a lost person that you met and the, the pain and grief they're facing, the brokenness of the world around us and how much we need to go and engage with these people. Maybe you're having a, a prayer time for an unreached people group in your area and you're casting vision. How could God use us in this group to reach out to this unreached people group? But every time you meet, you vision cast. Okay, so that's one thing. And uh, then, uh, so don't skip vision casting, right? Yeah, the next thing that I would say that really helps with multiplication, if you're seeing that people are not multiplying, I would check on how are you doing on asking the question, who will you share with? And how are you doing at reporting on that at the beginning of your meeting, right? Um, are people sharing? If they're not sharing, why are they not sharing? One of the reasons that people don't share is if we don't actually practice the story enough so that they gain confidence that they can tell that story. So that could be one thing. Maybe you aren't actually, you're just reading the scripture once or twice, but people are not actually getting comfortable enough with it to share it with someone else. So, um, you know, especially if you are using a story from the Bible, actually spend a little more time, choose a short story or do the stories in parts and um, make sure that they feel confident that everybody there in the group feels like they can share that story. Another thing you want to do is make sure that they are specific about who they're going to share it with. And you as the facilitator, write that down and then uh, pray for them specifically as they're sharing. So if they just say, I'll share it with my friend, Say, what's your friend's name? I want to be sure to write write your friend's name down. I'll be praying for you as you share with them this week, right? So get specific. And then, you know, remember, disciple making is not a meeting. So throughout the week, before your next meeting, send them a WhatsApp message, send them a text, give them a call and say, hey, did you get to share with your uncle? I know you were going to try to share the story. How did that go? I'm praying for you. So you want to kind of up the friendly accountability and the friendly encouragement to them um, in specific ways. Okay, so that's another way that you can help those groups to begin to multiply. Then another tip I have for you is if you have people who you know they're faithful, 
they love God, uh, they come, but they're just not sharing with others. Again, to build their confidence, I encourage you to take them with you to share the story with someone and let them watch how you do that. Let them watch how you bridge that conversation into a story um, and, you know, take them out with you to do some evangelism or prayer walking and meet some people, talk to people. Often people need more um, field-based mentoring in order to gain that confidence, right? If we just tell them you should do this, sometimes they're not going to do it because they just don't feel confident. They're, uh, they haven't learned that skill well enough. So take them out with you, share with them, um, <coughs> share, share, uh, share the story with somebody or take them with you when you go to share it with your auntie or uncle or cousin or whoever you're sharing with. Say, hey, you want to come along? I'm going to share tonight with my auntie. I'm going to visit her. Why don't you come? And uh, model for them what it looks like to share with others. And then the last thing I would say, if your groups aren't multiplying and uh, the people in your group are not uh, sharing, they're not multiplying, they're not starting new groups, um, is pray, really pray for them. I would challenge you, are you praying daily for the people that are in that group and that you're training? Are you really praying for them that God would really give them that confidence, that God would give them the boldness they need this week to actually share with others? And um, prayer is huge. If we want to see movements, we have to be people of prayer who pray specifically for the people that we train and for the people who are lost around us. And a specific prayer into this issue can make a huge difference. So I'd encourage you in that. And then lastly, if you have a group that, you know, is filled with disobedient people, you've done all these things that I talked about, <laughs> and they, they just don't want to, they don't want to obey what the word is, and they're not passing it on, I would then uh, discontinue the group. In a, in a gentle way, in a loving way, but I would move on and I would say, well, it's been great that we've been able to meet. We're going to meet two more times and kind of wrap things up, but thank you so much. It's been wonderful to have this time with you. Um, and I would discontinue and close the group and I would look for a person of peace in a new area, invest the time you're giving to the group into evangelism, see gospel sowing, find new persons of peace and start a new group with someone new and with their oikos and believe that God's going to give you some obedient disciples, people who really understand. A lot of times we're starting groups with existing believers who are already so conditioned, you know, from years and years of just being a church member. And um, because of that, it's not easy to get them to transition into being disciple makers. So uh, that's my input on that question. I hope that's helpful to you. And um, I will be back here next week at the same time. If you have questions or uh, issues, frustrations, blockages, things that you're hitting up against as you are attempting to make disciples and multiply disciples, put those in the chat. My staff will take note of that. And uh, I'll be sure to address your question next week. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful weekend. Go out and make and multiply disciples in your area. God is with you. And um, God bless. Bye for now.